which is a guest presentation by Professor David Escaramuzza, who also is affiliated with the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at the University of Zurich, and he is also affiliated with the Swiss National Competence Center for uh, Research in Robotics. He is one of the world's top experts on uh, flying robots and visual perception, so he has been doing so. I think we really deal with the hard issues. You know, we had the lecture from Christopher talking about visual perception, and now we have uh, Davide Scaramuzza, who is an expert on uh, visual perception. May I ask everybody to switch off their microphones to check whether you have really switched off your uh, microphones. There is a sound in the... Uh, in the global lecture hall, so that you really switch off the microphones. Okay, then uh, I think I, without further ado, I will pass the floor uh, to Davide. I think you need a, a microphone. What? So, like this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Rolfo, for your nice introduction. So my name is Davide Scaramuzza, and I'm a new assistant professor here at the University of Zurich. So the title of my presentation is uh, Vision-Based Navigation, a Ground and a Flying Robot pers Perspective. Now, depending on the time that we have available, we will see uh, 25 minutes. OK, we will see, depending also on the questions and the video, so which one I'm going to explain uh, the most. Um, some words about me. So I got my PhD at the ETH Zurich in uh, robotics and computer vision, and then I went for a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania, the GRASP lab. And I started here as a professor in February, so very recently. So my uh, research interest is uh, autonomous mobile robotics. And uh, in these slides, I, I try to summarize what, uh, the, what the current status and the, the progress of autonomous mobile robotics is. So we started in the past about 30, actually 50 years ago, and uh, with uh, the first, uh, very first robots that actually didn't have any perception on board. They were study they were, for example, uh, industrial manipulators like the KUKA, or we had um, autonomous ground vehicles that didn't have uh, any perception on board, and, but they were relying on uh, uh, magnetic guides, for example, for navigation. Then, uh, Thanks to the development of, uh, of the computer technology, and uh, especially for microelectromechanical systems, we can now scale down our uh, electric circuit and our computers. And so, therefore, we were able, since uh, uh, 2000, actually, to have uh, uh, a swarm, even a swarm of uh, uh, mobile robots, for example, that can uh, help humans uh, in a warehouse, for example, in the, in the middle, um, in the top middle picture, what you can see is actually a company called the Kiva Systems that was recently um, uh, sold to Amazon. And um, there are about 1,000 robots that uh, every day uh, work there, like 24 hours, and uh, they just uh, deliver goods from the shelves uh, to, the, to the human operator. Actually, it's the shelf itself that is moving and is going directly to the human operator. And there are inter interesting videos on YouTube. And uh, they are also using onboard perception. And uh, as we will see during this talk, uh, uh, the most uh, um, important things actually in uh, autonomous robotics actually ro localization. Uh, so the robot should know where it is in the environment. And uh, also we were able to send, for example, rovers to Mars. And recently, just uh, two months ago, the last one was sent. And uh, they are using a lot of uh, cameras. Actually, the last uh, rover, Curiosity, is using at least 24 cameras. So there is quite a lot of perception ongoing. So what is the future? In the future, we will have even more and more perception. So for example, you can see the Google cars are already um, an actual fact. Then um, we will also have uh, autonomous micro aerial vehicles that I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about it. And hopefully one day also a human, uh, humanoid robots that can also interact with people. Um, so why do we need autonomous cars? Because they are, they are smarter, safer, and cleaner. They can assist uh, the human in driving function, thus reducing the car, uh, car accidents, hopefully. They can also provide the drivers with the real-time information about their own networks, so thus avoiding con congestion. And they can optimize the journey or uh, the engine performance, thus reducing the overall fuel consumption. Actually, it is estimated that uh, in, um, uh, in car accidents, uh, the human factor 
is involved in 90% of the accidents. So there is a big interest in developing uh, intelligent uh, autonomous cars or intelligent cars. But why do we need also autonomous micro helicopters? First of all, because they are more agile than uh, ground robots. And if you think about uh, what happened last year in uh, Fukushima in Japan at the nuclear, nuclear power plant, they were, um, after this uh, explosion at the power plant building, they um, asked this American company called iRobot to uh, send to Japan two uh, ground robots in order to explore the inside of the building. What happened is that uh, the robots were actually very useful. They were teleoperated. Sorry. Uh, can you describe the difference between a mouse or a helicopter? Yes. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> a micro when I say micro helicopter, a micro helicopter is, uh, we don't have to think of uh, an, a, a robot at a micro scale. Actually, it's a, um, contrary to the big scale helicopters, a micro means in this case of, uh, the size of a 50 centimeters, half a meter. So. And uh, now we call a nano helicopters this size, of about 10, 20 centimeters. As you can see, it's a very <laughs> arbitrary <laughs> interpretation, unfortunately. And actually, in uh, uh, other people in uh, other roboticists in uh, mobile robotics, they call uh, now, uh, they work actually on medical robotics, they call nanorobots, really robots that are in the micro nano scale. So as you can see, people working in different fields of robotics, they, have, they use different measurement units. So I was saying that there is a lot of interest in developing uh, micro helicopters this size because they can be of help, for example, during, during um, uh, ser uh, search and rescue operations. Like, for example, in Fukushima, they used the ground robots, and uh, the ground robots had to stop in many occasions due to the presence of obstacles, while aerial vehicles can fly over the obstacle, are more agile, and can provide a bird eye view of the, of the environment. Now, how do we build, in general, uh, an autonomous mobile robot, uh, either ground or aerial? Well, there are four building blocks uh, that are very important that you should always implement uh, when, you, when you work on uh, autonomous mobile robotics. The first important block is uh, perception, the yellow block there, that basically tells the robot uh, how to perceive the environment. It can be done using cameras or lasers. Then the second important block is uh, localization, that uh, basically it tells the robot where it is with respect to the map of the environment. So in order to localize, the robot needs to have a map of the environment. Then after the robot uh, knows where it is, so it can then finally plan the trajectory in order to reach the end goal. And this is actually called cognition or path planning. And then we have the last building block, which is a motion control, which uh, basically uh, deals with um, what the velocity and position commands to send to the actuators in order to move and plan a trajectory. So, in this talk, I'm going to focus uh, mainly on perception and lo localization. And we will see that two things are actually very much linked. So, Rolf before said that robot perception is indeed very important. And it is important, I think, for two main factors. First of all, it allows a robot to see and perceive the environment. And second of all, it allows the robot to be truly autonomous without relying on an external re reference frame. Maybe Nathan, can, uh, can you send this video? So what you can see in this video is actually very impressive. It's um, a swarm of nano quadcopters. Quadcopter means that they, it's a helicopter with four rotors. They are nano, and actually they are in the size of 14 centimeters. Between um, and 3D. Can you re maybe remove the audio, please? So as you can see there, it's very impressive. They are actually, um, these people are working in on coordinated flight, distributed control. But actually, the reality is that these helicopters are not really autonomous because they don't have the eyes on board. The cameras are not on board, but actually are off board. As actually, sometimes you can see that on the top there are some red lights, and those red lights are actually a motion capture system. What is a motion capture system? It's actually a system of uh, very expensive and very precise cameras that can track the position of the robots with millimeter accuracy at 300 frames per second. So it allows the researchers to focus on control problems rather than on perception problem, okay? Because let's say the, the localization is done off board. But we will go more in detail later. So as I said, localization is the most important thing, but in order to localize a robot should know where it is in the map, right? So how do we build a map? Any ideas? 
Nedan, can you please play this video? So this is a very famous video from uh, Sebastian Tran, one of the most uh, influent people in uh, uh, um, autonomous uh, cars. Uh, here you can see, for example, a mobile robot moving in, a, in an office environment that is actually building a map. So in order to build a map, the robot mounts laser scanners. Laser scanners are, are sensors that for every position, so basically there is a, like a laser pointer inside, that for every position of the laser pointer in a space, it returns the, the, the distance of so, the laser spot. So, Davide, just to make the connection yeah. to the previous lecture, so in a sense you are trying to build a model of yes. the real world, a representation Correct. Correct. of the real Correct. world, right? Yes, thank you, yes. Exactly, yes. We need a representation of the real world. So, how does the mapping work? Uh, you, you saw it there. So, while the robot moves, it basically extracts local maps with the laser scanner, and then it stitches all these little maps together. But the problem was that when the robot comes back to the initial position, oh, the, the, the map actually doesn't, the, the starting point and the end point, they don't match. This problem is actually called um, um, error loop closure, actually, loop closure, because actually, usually it happens when, whenever the robot tries to close a loop, um, a loop trajectory. And so there are ways to overcome this problem, so to recognize that actually the robot reached the first uh, and the starting point, and this is actually the problem of SLAM. So SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, and that's been uh, one of the um, main topic of uh, autonomous mobile robotics of the last uh, 20 years. Here you can see another map built uh, using a laser uh, scanner. This is a top view. This is, for example, a side view, and then after colorizing the point, the point cloud. So as I said, the SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, and it has been a topic for about uh, 15 years. It started in, um, in 1995. As you can see, the first uh, eight years were dominated by laser range finders, and only about around 2003, cameras were, started, were starting to be used. So what kind of information do you get from a, a laser rangefinder? From laser rangefinder, you basically get uh, um, a po distances, ranges. Basically, for every point in the space where the laser is pointing to, you get the, the distance of that point. Okay? So inside the laser scanner, there is a, a rotating, um, um, there is a motor, and with the, uh, there is actually a rotating laser pointer that basically allows you to get a 3D point cloud. We call it point cloud because actually, as you can see in these uh, images, it's basically, it's, it's not a really dense reconstruction, it's a sparse reconstruction made of points. And actually, we, when you use cameras, this is even uh, uh, more sparse than with laser. So building a map with cameras, as we will see, is very, very, very challenging. So let's try to see how we can make, so the goal of this now lecture is to talk a little bit about vision-based autonomous navigation, and we will start with aerial vehicles, and then maybe we will see some application for ground vehicles. So this was part of a European project that I was coordinating for the last uh, three and a half years. It's called the S-Fly, that stands for Swarm of Microflying Robots. It was a big European project that actually was composed of at least uh, uh, three four countries. And um, so, as I said before, the most important problem for uh, the most important, the most challenging um, block for in order to have an autonomous, autonomous robot is localization. Probably most of you are very familiar with GPS. At least I'm sure that 80% uh, uh, of you have used a GPS. At least uh, for sure you, you guys all go use Google Maps, and uh, for sure you have also an iPhone, and the iPhone gives you very precisely the pos your position in a global reference frame, which is the uh, world reference frame from the GPS. Now, now, can we use a GPS to make uh, our robots uh, autonomous? Yes, actually, yes, why not? Actually, they're very accurate and they allow, for example, the American drones to fly on the other uh, side of the, of the globe. But if we try to have, for example, a small helicopter to fly in a city, especially in a very crowded, uh, cluttered city with, with a lot of buildings, well, this system will not work. So if we put a GPS on board our helicopter, and then we ask the helicopter to fly autonomously in Zurich, to go, for example, from uh, the university to, I don't know, to the uh, city center, it will fail completely. Actually, it will crash in the first three seconds. And the reason is because the GPS is not accurate in urban environments. 
what is the reason? The reason is because we have uh, tall buildings, so basically we are receiving the signal from the satellites, the signal bumps with the walls of the building, so there is a delay, there is also, that, uh, also the attenuation of the signal with the, of the, with the atmosphere, and also the buildings themselves, they occlude the line of sight, the line of sight with the satellites. So basically, if you basically don't see the satellites, uh, the, your uh, mm, um, precision is even worse. And I can tell you that actually the precision of GPS in the best cases is about three centimeters, the three meters, and it can get as worse as 70 meters. So it can be very large. Of course, you could use also differential GPS or real-time real, real -time kinematic GPS, but still, you always rely on an external signal coming from, uh, from a satellite. So for migrate aerial vehicles, so GPS, in the end, is not very good, at least if you fly in an urban environment. And especially if you fly indoors, you don't have GPS. So you have to use other means. Nathan, could you please play this video? So what you're going to see in this video is people at MIT that in 2009 won uh, the International Micro Aerial Vehicle Competition using uh, a small helicopter equipped with a laser. So the laser was scanning all on one plane. So basically, you can only extract two-dimensional maps of the environment. So in order to have a 3D map, the helicopter has to go up and down. It has to move up and down. It has to change its height with respect to the, to the floor. And then while moving, the helicopter was actually building a map. Now, these lasers usually weigh have a weight of about 500 grams, even up to one kilogram. Now, imagine that you want to put a laser on a small scale a helicopter of about 100 grams, it's really impossible. So at the moment, even though lasers are actually a very uh, good source of information, they're very, they are an active sensor and also very precise, uh, still they are too big, too, ex um, uh, too heavy to be mounted on a smaller helicopter. Um, before I mentioned, there are other ways to have autonomous uh, uh, helicopters. Uh, for example, using the motion capture system. So what you can see in this slide actually is really the, what the motion capture system uh, looks like. We have on the top some uh, um, special cameras. They are infrared. Basically, they emit infrared light, and uh, there are also some uh, special reflective markers on the helicopters. So these cameras can then track the markers on the helicopters, and knowing how the markers are located with respect to the helicopter body frame, they can def de uh, therefore estimate the position and orientation of the helicopter in space. And this is done really if, uh, at 300 frames per second, so very, very fast. But as I said, the, these cameras are actually um, off board. They are not mounted on board. Therefore, they, these helicopters are not really autonomous. So in this European project, S-Fly, we put cameras on board the vehicle. And here you can see a small helicopter, especially the, 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 ground, the, the bottom part of the helicopter, with a small fisheye lens. Fisheye lens is actually it's a, it's a lens that has a wide field of view. And the wide field of view allows us actually to... Um, to see up to 150 degrees. So it's actually almost like a human eye, okay? It's very important to have a large field of view because in this, you can always, um, as we will see, you're able to track point of interest that are, I mean, even around uh, on the border of the image. Now, so we have an onboard camera, but now how can we replace the GPS? How do we know where we are? Actually, the question that we want to ask is, given an image, suppose that we are flying, in Zurich, we take an image, then the helicopter takes another image at a different position, and now we want to know the relative motion, so rotation and relative translation, between these two frames. How do we do that? Any idea? Yes? Yeah. Uh -huh. So your colleague is saying, you can try to extract some features and then try to relate each other. So what are features? Features are points of interest. Point of interest can be corners. What are corners? Corners are um, points that are at the intersection of edges. And then uh, your colleague said, uh, so we extract features on both images, and then we relate each other. This problem is called the correspondence problem. So we have to know who is who. So we have to really um, pair points in the first image with the points in the second image. 
This can be done by using some similarity matrix, uh, similarity matrix like uh, uh, cross correlation. Then after we have given the correspondences, what we do is that we use some uh, linear algebra and the 3D geometry theory, and basically we are able to reconstruct so all these points in 3D, but also to reconstruct in close form the rotation and translation of the cameras with respect to the initial frame. Okay? So this can be done. Could you please play this video? Now what you're going to see in this video, it's a very recent paper. Uh, it's from a paper from Washington University called uh, Building Rome in a Day. And what you can see here, that one is a reconstruction of the Colosseum in Rome that was done using a 3 million images downloaded from Flickr.com. But the reason why the, the paper is called the Building Rome in a Day is that uh, it took 24 hours of computation with a cluster of 20, 250 computers. Now, OK, so we can solve this problem. We can also have a very, a very nice um, reconstruction of cities. And actually, they, they show on their website a uh, reconstruction of many other cities in Europe. But uh, how can we scale this down in, in order to do it on a small helicopter, this big, especially with a very, very, with a very limited computer? Well, first of all, we have to say that uh, we, are not, we, we don't use, we usually don't extract 3 million images. We don't need to do this. And also, there are ways to optimize uh, um, a lot our search. For example, by taking advantage of the fact that uh, our cameras are not really freely to move. Even though they are flying, they are not really freely to move, but there are some dyna dynamic models. So whenever we work in, robo in robotics, we have to consider the models underlying our uh, robots. So for example, a, a car can only move on a plane, and it has to satisfy so-called non-holomic constraints. And same also a helicopter, it cannot move, it cannot make, uh, it, can, it cannot move in every, uh, in every direction, it has to satisfy some specific dynamic constraints. So there are ways to make uh, these algorithms run very fast. Here are a few inf uh, some information about uh, our um, uh, equipment. So we were using, a, as a computer, an Intel Atom 1.6 gigahertz. We used also GPRS at the time, now 3G, for communicating with helicopters. Um, the helicopters were really light, eh, light so 800 grams. Um, now, could you play this video? So in this video, you can see one of the earliest uh, results that we got two years ago on uh, autonomous uh, navigation. So what you can see now, now, on the right side, you can see the helicopter flying completely autonomously. In particular, there it was uh, taking off from one table and landing on another table, which was located three meters away. And what you can see in the left uh, video is actually what the, the camera sees. So it sees the fissures, or interest points. It's computing, uh, it's triangulating the points when it moves, and then building a map. And then it uses this map in order to localize with respect to the map. And so it can plan the next trajectory. So once we have a local map of the environment, we can immediately specify the waypoints. So we can tell the robot where to go. OK. And uh, since uh, we are using a camera, so a, a vision sensor, this problem is actually called Visual Slam. That stands for Vision Based Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. And uh, could we play this video also? So then uh, we moved on, and then uh, one and a half year ago, we made some, some first earlier experiments uh, outdoors. We went uh, near Zurich in uh, Birmensdorf. And uh, at that time, it was, it was actually snowing. So that's why you see a lot of uh, white there. So again, on the left, you have the onboard camera images, and on the right, the full 3D reconstruction, and this time, even with texture. So how do we attach the texture here? So first, we build a point cloud, a sparse map, made only of points. And then, uh, basically, we interpolate um, between the points, and then we copy-paste the texture from the original images. Do you think that, actually, texture is important for a robot, or is more important for a human? Well, yeah. yes. any suggestions? Uh, yes, I want to ask you something. OK, yes. go ahead. Um, the camera that you are using is white, right? How you stitch the image between them? So, and uh, how you deal with that? Um, I didn't really understand the question. How we stitch uh, the images, you mean? 
Yes, because uh, the image that you have is from a wide camera, wide lens camera, right? Wireless camera, right. Ah, okay, yes. Okay, so um, initially we, had, we were using um, a wireless camera, right? We were streaming the images uh, to a laptop um, because uh, at that time we didn't have a, a fast onboard computer and also our... <laughs> our, our, our... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is not my question. The ah. camera that you, you're using have wide, uh, wide lens. Ah, wide field of view. Right, okay, I see, I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, how you, you can know and stitch the image between them? Because in, in, in the corners, is not, the image is not the same with the center, right? In the what? In the, the image, the, you have the first image. The first image in the corners is different than the next frame that right. it will, it is further, far, ah, yeah, far course, away I from, see, I from the, the question. Frame. Okay, I understand the question. So, yeah, um, I couldn't say all the details, but basically what we do, when you extract these um, interest points, um, the, these interest points are actually projected on a unisphere, okay? So they become unit vectors. And then uh, when we move to a different location, we have to match these points across the two images, and of course, uh, we can only match them as long as there is, the motion is not too, too large. Otherwise, the distortion introduced by the lens is too, too, too broad to be able to match this point. So you have to make sure that, the, this, that uh, you take images as far as apart as possible between each other, but also not too far. Otherwise, there is too much distortion to be able to correctly match the point. So there is a trade-off between these two. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, what are typical problems now in navigation using a single uh, camera? Um, that basically, when you reconstruct this, the environment, the map that you reconstruct uh, doesn't have uh, measurement units. You don't know if it's meters, kilometers, miles, or millimeters, or micron. Because basically, if you close one eye, you don't have uh, any idea of the perception of the, of the um, um, uh, of the range of things. You only can measure relative range, relative distances, right? But you cannot really infer the distance really in, in, in meters unless you open both eyes. And this is called a stereometry. And um, with a single camera, this is called a scale ambiguity problem. And uh, therefore, there are different ways to overcome this problem. For example, you can uh, measure the, the size of an image, of, a, of an object in the real environment, and then you can rescale the whole map with respect to that object. But also another uh, interesting cue would be the, to use inertial sensors. So inertial sensors are sensors that provide acceleration and uh, um, um, orientation information, so gyroscopes. Or you could also use an air pressure sensor. Air pressure sensor, they measure the, the pressure of the, uh, the, um, um, uh, the the air pressure, and basically they can give you indirectly the, the height of the helicopter with respect to the ground, for example. So these are all sensors that co can provide some sort of absolute information that are not relative. Um, it's actually very important to use uh, this alternative way of information because uh, if you just use a single camera or cameras only, what happens typically is that, uh, suppose that you tell the helicopter to go straight, right? So the helicopter has to first build a map and then uh, Suppose that the helicopter is flying over a plane, a planar ground, okay? So we know that it's planar, but it doesn't know that it's planar, right? So it starts estimating, but because it's incremental, it's an incremental estimation, there are uncertainties involved. What happens is that actually the map is never perfectly straight. It's, it's bend, it bends. Uh, the more you move, the more it bends. It can bend either, either to the, to, um, um, to the bottom, uh, down or up. Um, now, how can the helicopter actually f um, solve this, uh, this ambiguity? By using the vestibular information like human, we humans do. So by using uh, proprioceptive sensors like acceler accelerometer and, and gyroscope, we can actually find out that actually the estimation of the map conflicts with our onboard proprioceptive estimation of our current orientation because we have accelerometers also as humans. You know when you're up upside down or you're standing, right? Because we have a, a kind of gravity sensor inside. So same do uh, the inertial measurement units. They have a gravity, um, gravidometer or gravity sensor that always measure precisely the vertical direction. In this way, we actually can tell the helicopter that uh, it has to correct the map. 
Otherwise, the helicopter would crash. Um, could we play the left one? So S fly outdoor demo asphalt. This video is actually very interesting. So when you play with these helicopters, uh, it, sometimes it can be dangerous because um, uh, they could, sometimes something can go wrong and then uh, uh, they can scratch uh, your skin. So that's why sometimes we use a uh, fishing rods like this one, especially when we do experiments in close proximity to, to people and students. So what you can see here is a, a quadcopter hovering over the asphalt. And actually the asphalt is not the best texture, the best ground for uh, uh, vision-based controlled robots. The reason is because the asphalt does not provide enough um, contrast, at least nowadays. Maybe later, in the next years, we will, come, we will have a much better cameras that will have a better contrast, higher resolution, and we will be able to distinguish really the details of the texture of this asphalt. But so what happens in this video is that what you can see is that as the helicopter goes up, it starts oscillating. The reason is because when the helicopter is, um, is high in the air, it loses the contrast um, in the image uh, shrinks, it reduces, and therefore the helicopter becomes unstable. Um, can we play this one? This video is also very interesting because here you can really see now a comparison between a GPS stabilized helicopter and a vision only stabilized helicopter. So what's the difference? How do we see the difference? Yeah, um, Na Nathan, could you play in a, in a, in a loop? So the GPS base, as you can see, is actually um, moving in a circle of about three meters. And in fact, that was the precision of the GPS there. As I said, the precision of GPS is never better than three meters if you just use a standard GPS. Now, the vision-based uh, helicopter is much more stable, as you can see. Why? Because actually the, it, it relies on the camera. The camera um, is looking down. It sees uh, points from, uh, from the ground. And basically, as, as soon as you move, the pixel position changes in the image, and therefore it tells the helicopter to restabilize, okay? So in this case, for example, a, a, a vision-based control is much more stable than a GPS-based control. Now, um, this is a very recent result that we got a few months ago. Here, what you will see is a three helicopters moving in a, in a kind of a, a, um, a structured environment outdoors without using GPS, but only onboard cameras. And uh, we have uh, three helicopters that are actually mapping um, in a known area. So they take off completely autonomously without GPS. There are three helicopters. Here is what each helicopter can see. So it first extracts all the, salim, the interest points, it matches them across images, and then builds a sparse 3D map of the environments. Here you can see the map. So as you can see, it's very sparse. It's just a point cloud, the yellow points. And on the top, you can see the positions of the helicopter during the motion. Now, there are three helicopters. Each one is building its own map. Right? Now, question to you. How can they localize with respect to each other? How do they know where they are with respect to each other? Do you know? Well, so maybe we can also ask the other side. Yes, I'm asking everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, any suggestions? You could find uh, correspondences between the, the maps of each uh, helicopter. Yeah, correct. Correct. And uh, exactly, so this is actually an image query problem. It's exactly what uh, Google Images is doing, for example. When you, you know, in Google Images, uh, since a few months, there is uh, the possibility of uploading an image and uh, ask Google, to ask Google to, um, to give you the most similar image in the database, the most similar image to your query image. So this is the same problem. These three helicopters are actually building their own maps. And now we want to express all these maps in a common global reference frame. So there will be points, there will be moments where these helicopters actually overlap. The maps of these helicopters overlap, right? So we have to be able to recognize overlaps, so blue closures between these different helicopters. So what we do is that constantly um, we are comparing each image with all the other images collected by the, all the other helicopters. 
but in order to be smart also and efficient, we also use uh, our position information, okay, in order to, uh, let's say, the, make the algorithm all efficient. So we basically compare each helicopter image with all the other images of, from the other helicopters, and then we find, let's say, the most similar images, and then we, we pick the one that is closest to the, uh, to the reference image. Once we find the most similar images, we can then comp uh, compute the two transformations, and then, if you want, you can then stitch all the three maps together into a single map. Yeah, please. Yes. No. Yeah. It's a very good question. Yeah, actually, this is a very open problem. We are working uh, on it. But can you repeat? So the question was, uh, does this scale uh, with the number uh, of helicopters? Yes, it does scale linearly uh, with the number of helicopters. So currently, with three helicopters, the old system works at 30 frames per second, and then uh, it uh, increases uh, with the number of helicopters. So, so, of course, you can imagine having a, bit, a, a bigger ground station, a bigger computer, but of course, we have to find ways to make uh, uh, this to problem, as, uh, let, let's say, do not, do not scale linearly with the number of helicopters, but even better. Um, so uh, this is actually current investigation problem. Very good question. Other question? Yes? Just a short question from Berlin. Yes. Um, thanks. Right. Um, I, I, I didn't quite understand. Is the computation all done on board, or is it done somewhere centrally for that experiment here? So it's hybrid. Um, most of the computation is done on board. Each helicopter computes its own uh, uh, features and its own uh, estimate of the motion with respect to the starting point. But when we have to find loop closures, overlaps between different maps, we actually send all this information, so features and, um, and images to the ground station. So if you want, the, every single helicopter is responsible of its, of its own uh, local stabilization and local map, while the ground station is actually a computer like this one, it's a standard laptop, uh, I, um, i7, does, receives all the images, and then it computes all the loop closures between all the images all the overlaps. So it's hybrid. Yeah. So I can perhaps mention that Verena Hafner's group at the Humboldt University in Berlin is also, they are also experts on the flying robots ah. and they're thinking about similar types ah. of problems that you're thinking about. Okay. Interesting, interesting. Other questions? I saw two hands there. Yes? Yeah, another very good question. So the question is, uh, how does it um, um, deal with the changing environments? And this is still another open problem. For example, um, if you uh, build a map, say, in the early morning, and then you try to fly with the same map in the afternoon or uh, in the evening, it might not work, because the appearance of the images is different from the one you recorded in the morning. So these are all still very open problem, uh, research problem. And maybe you have changing lighting conditions. Yes, right? changing lighting conditions. Shadows, for example, clouds. These all create problems. So as you can see, vision perception, especially vision, is very um, challenging. Much more than laser, because in laser uh, perception, you basically emit the light. It's uh, an active sensor. In perception, it's passive. Do we still have time? Or? Uh, can, can you try to conclude? Sort of yes. Conclude slowly. Yeah, I, sh well, I want to show you finally. Um, uh, we go to the last slide. Uh, do I have control on this? Okay. Very quick. No, I, I just want to have, go very quickly. You have to just click through the whole thing. Ah, uh -huh, do I? So, could we play this video? So where does all this um, uh, work actually also, uh, how can all this work actually be extended also to consumer electronics or other uh, industrial applications than just robotics? I don't know if you're familiar with the scanner mouse that has been sold now since uh, last year uh, in Amazon, Interdiscount, Media Markt. Uh, it's sold everywhere, both in Europe and the US and Asia. It's um, currently, um, it's actually a startup from EDH here, uh, where I was uh, working as a consultant. And, um, not, but it's uh, actually uh, sold by LG and very soon by Logitech and many other man uh, mouse manufacturers. This mouse uh, is able to scan any 
paper document by just waving your hand on the document. And uh, it scales very well also with the um, bigger uh, pictures, uh, but of course, again, it depends how big the area to scan is, because otherwise it takes all your memory. Because in the end, what it's doing is visual slam. Of course, this is much more efficient than, than the, our helicopter's slam, because we are moving on a plane, so we're exploring other motion constraints. Okay? And plus, the illumination change is not really a problem, because actually this sensor as inside some LEDs, infrared LEDs, that basically uh, keep the illumination constant within the mouse itself, okay? So this makes sure that uh, the, this mouse works 100%, okay? So uh, with this, I would like to conclude my talk, and thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Davide. Uh, so uh, we can now open the... Uh, uh, for uh, open the lecture for uh, questions, the lecture hall, the global lecture hall. So, are there questions to Davide? Maybe I can I can start. With there is a question there. Oh, oh, there is a question. Okay, <laughs> maybe I'll just give you the microphone, then everybody can hear you. Okay. So, thanks for your talk. Um, what is your or what are your long-term goals with? Um, uh, making these flying robots. Do you have any long-term goal? Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, in uh, 10 years' time, maybe? <laughs> this is a very tough question. So, they, um, Yes, my long-term goal is actually to uh, investigate collaboration between ground robots, aerial robots, and humans. So humans and robots should be part of the same team, and we call this a multi-agent system. And... Um, one of the biggest problems, if you want, when you have multiple robots is the, uh, interacting with human operators uh, is actually how to have the human um, simultaneously control several robots at the same time. As you can see, I'm putting the human inside because I think that to have a really truly autonomous robot, fully autonomous, we still have to wait more than 10 years. So I think that we, in order to put the robots really in the fields, in fields like search and rescue, it's very important to have... Uh, at least the semi-autonomous robots, where the uh, human operator is only responsible to send high-level commands to the robots, and then the robots would, would find out how to um, uh, do the, lo the, lo the local control. For example, to fly this helicopter is very challenging, even for myself. Um, uh, it takes a lot of time. Actually, there we always had a very experienced professional pilot for each helicopter. And, um, but as soon as you put, for example, cameras on board or other sensors, it's very easy. It becomes extremely easy to, uh, to fly these helicopters. Um, so interaction with human operator is something that I want to do. Another point that I want to focus is actually uh, not on autonomous helicopters with uh, uh, cameras on board, but uh, on flying cameras, where basically my interest in is having these helicopters as small as possible, because the smaller they are, the safer they are uh, for the environment, especially for the people. But also, uh, when they are very small, then you have to use uh, uh, all the cameras, at least for the moment, and then it becomes extremely challenging to control this for all these open problems. So uh, flying cameras is one problem, and the other one is also the interaction with the, with the ground robots. So can we have uh, these flying robots communicate with ground robots and coordinate each other's motion in order to accomplish a certain task? Right, especially okay. for disaster sites, rescue For disaster sites, like yes. That would be very interesting, yes. yes. Okay, maybe we can take uh, one last uh, question. We have one here from Budapest. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, you talked about uh, techniques with lasers, vision, and GPS, and uh, advantages and disadvantages of those. Uh, what about combining them? Yeah. Is it possible? <laughs> of course, of course. Yes, so this is a very good question. So why did I co didn't we combine them together? because we wanted to see how far we could go by just using vision. So that's why in our specifications we said we are not going to use GPS and we are not going to use vision. But of course, if you combine all these sensors together, you get a most more robust robot, of course, that can, is able to face any kind of different kind of limitations that the other sensors would not be able to face. So by having multiple sensors, of course, you um, take advantage of uh, complementary information so it's always very important to use more, more, more sensors, okay? Yeah, it was just okay. an interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So I think uh, we should probably... Uh
come to a close. So thank you again, Davide, thank you very much. for a fascinating lecture.